I'm sorry, am I still recording a video here? A coding challenge idea that has been suggested to me many times is a falling sand simulation. And today is the day that I'm going to tackle it. Now, I have to confess, this is not the first time that I've tried to make a falling sand simulation. If you're familiar with the initiative called January, which is a month of generative art in January, it's probably happening right now because I think it's January 2024. Uh, in 2022, I made a falling sand uh, simulation for, uh, for January. I have no recollection of how I did it. So, but hopefully there's some muscle memory or deep within the recesses of my brain that will help me through today. A really excellent, wonderful reference, if you're like, what are you even talking about, is the game Noita. It's built on top of the Falling Everything engine, which is this incredible game engine where every single pixel is simulated. I'd also love to highlight Max Bitker's Sandspiel. It might not be how it's pronounced, but I choose to pronounce it Sandspiel, um, where you could just create this world of sand and water and fire and smoke and fungus all out of pixels. My previous coding challenge, if you happen to watch it, was about cellular automata, and in fact, this falling sand simulation, this idea of any pixel having a state, is it sand, is it water, is it fire, and changing its state based on what its neighbors are doing, I believe this can be done with CA-like rules. Now, maybe you wanna keep watching this video, but I do wanna just mention that there is this wonderful tutorial online by Jason at jason.today about making a falling sand simulator with P5JS. So we'll see, we'll compare and contrast, maybe at the end we'll see how does my version work, how does Jason's version work, but you could also go check that out, make your own version, submit it to the Passenger Showcase, and we'll see what kinds of amazing projects this community can make out of falling sand simulated. Let's first establish the world that I intend to create. So the Wolfram Elementary CA was a one-dimensional CA where every cell had a state of a zero or a one. Coding challenge 105, I think, was the game of life, which is a two-dimensional CA, meaning the grid lives in two dimensions and every cell has a state of zero or one. For the falling sand simulation, a two-dimensional grid makes more sense. Let's say this is my P5JS canvas, and I decide that I'm going to place a grain of sand on the canvas. That means maybe this particular cell's state is one, and all the other states are zero. I want the sand to fall, meaning the rule will be if there is a cell with a state of one that has a cell with a state of zero below it, then that piece of sand will move from its current location to the location below. If it so happens that there is already a cell with a state of one below it, then it can't move, it stops. That way the sand will pile up. Let's begin by implementing only that. To make my life a little easier, I'm going to grab this make 2D array function from the Game of Life coding challenge. Then let's call the space that I'm going to create a grid. And let's establish the resolution of every grain of sand. Now, at some point it might be fun to try having a grain of sand be a single pixel. But for now, let's have a 10 by 10 rectangle. So I need to establish the number of columns and rows. The number of columns is the width of the canvas divided by the width of one of those little squares. So in this case, 40 divided by 10. 400 divided by 10 would be 40. So I'm gonna have a 40 by 40 grid. So that's what I need to size my two-dimensional array as. So I'm using a nested loop to set every position, every column I, every row J to zero. I can then use that same nested loop to draw every square. Maybe if it's zero, it's black. If it's one, it's white. And just so we can see it, let me give it a stroke of 255. Oh, and the X position would be the column times the width of that square. 
There we go, a grid of black squares. That's exactly what I expected to see. What happens now if I set one particular cell on this grid to have a state of one? Look at that. Column 20, row 10 is now white. I am ready to implement this logic. I need to run a loop over every single one of these cells and look for any ones, then check what is the surroundings of that particular one. Now, while I'm doing this analysis, I cannot change the values in the original grid. So I need another two-dimensional grid that can act as the next grid, the next generation, the next frame of animation of this falling sand simulation. Let's get the state of the current cell we're looking at. If the state is one, I need to look below and see what is there. This is not Carl's rows, this is I, J. The state of the current cell that I'm on. And the cell below is J plus one. If the state below has a value of zero, then the cell I, J should now have a state of zero in the next generation, and below should have a state of one. And now, the current grid is the next grid. I've missed some steps here, but let's see what we, how far we get. Okay, so everything went white. So why? Well, one issue is when I make this new 2D array, it doesn't have any values in it. And I'm only assigning the value zero or one if and when I find a one in the previous grid. I need to set all the values of the next grid. However, if I'm checking all the cells and I get to here, and I say like, oh, in the next generation, this one should be a zero and this one should be a one. I'm gonna keep checking and eventually I'm gonna get to here and find that it was a zero and probably say it should stay a zero. So what I think would work, I'm not 100% sure about this, is if I just start in with the new grid, the next generation having all zeros in it, and I'm just setting the values of one based on where the ones are in the previous generation. A way I can address this is by having the make 2D array function just fill everything with zeros. That way I'm only moving the ones around and the zeros are going to be there by default. I should mention that the way that I'm doing this, where the first index grid I is the column and the second index J is the row is maybe a little backwards depending on your point of view and your experience. If you're used to matrix math, a 2D array, you'd often be saying row column instead of column row, but this is just the way I did it in the game of life. And as long as I'm being consistent, it will work and it's fine, it's fine, it's fine. So now what I'm going to do is add another little J in here. Oh. Look at that, it works now, amazing. It disappeared when it hit the bottom. So I need to account for the edge. If below equals zero or if J plus one is greater than the number of rows. If J plus one is greater than the number of rows minus one. Oh, L or, <laughs> no, less than. If below is zero and J is not the bottom row. I have an or there and I said, and. If below is less zero, <laughs> why am I getting this wrong so many times? Oh, oh, otherwise it needs to stay as one. I, I might have had it right all those times. Otherwise, next grid, I, J, should stay as one. And in fact, if everything is going to be set initially to zero, I don't have to explicitly set it to zero. So I'm basically deciding if I should move it down or leave it where it is. Let's add some mouse interaction. When I click the mouse, I'll add a grain of sand. So if I take the mouse position divided by the size of each cell, the width of each cell, every cell is a square, that should give me the column and row index into my grid. Look, I'm piling up sand. Let's change this to mouse dragged. All right, we're cooking. However, I want to add some more sophistication here. What if I have a grain of sand and below it is a one so it can't move down. However, there is a space open to the left 
or the right. It could move to one of those empty spots. The sand would be falling down to the right and left, building up a little hill. So let's look at below right and below left. Now I should say, do I even need this? Because wouldn't it be undefined otherwise? Yeah, it works. I don't even need that. And some better error checking, yes, good, but eh, why not? Otherwise I could check if below right is zero. And then if that's the case, next grid i plus one j equals one, else if below left equals zero, i minus one. Whoa, boy, okay. All right, I did forget. It's kind of scooting across there. I do need to uh, ignore the bottom row. So I only want to check if j equals rows minus one, keep it the same. This if statement has gotten really out of control. I will refactor this later. So if it hits the bottom, don't do anything. Oh, it's gonna keep going. Wait, oh, I have to go down one. Oh, I'm, I'm only going to the right. I also have to go down one. Well, of course. So I actually don't have this problem. <laughs> Welcome to a coding challenge where I didn't plan this in advance. Okay, let's come back to this. Okay, this is better. Okay, there we go. Look at my falling sand simulation. Now we do have a little bit of a problem. Notice how it's always gonna go to the right first. What would be a nice way of having that be random? I'm gonna call it below A and below B, plus DIR minus DIR. DIR is either negative one or positive one. How do I figure out that? Well, DIR is one, and if random of one is less than 0.5, then multiply DIR times negative one. Oh, I can't wait to hear your better way of doing that in the comments. So A is going to be plus or minus, B is going to be the opposite of that. And then if below A is zero, we're saying plus DIR. And if below B is zero, we're saying minus DIR. So now it should randomly go left or right. Oh, oh, I'm not, I need to handle the left and right edges. How do I do that? Oh, whoops. Ah, I forgot the plus one here. I need the plus one here also. Okay, this looks more like falling sand now. It's not jump bouncing off like it was before. But why do I get an error here? I'm accessing a nested array. So it's fine if this is undefined, if the first part is undefined, I can't get the second part. That'll throw an error. Well, I think I could just check to see if I'm on an edge. Let's just do that. All right, I'm gonna say let below A and below B. Let's let them be undefined. I just need to check the left and the right, and I only need to check I. Okay, only if I is greater than zero and I is less than columns minus one then try to actually get a real value. <laughs> I still got an error. As long as i plus dir is greater than or equal to zero and i plus dir is less than or equal to the number of columns minus one, then I can do below a. This is me <laughs> double checking that that's a valid spot. Oh, it's oh, just because my mouse went off the screen. This is correct now, as clunky and terrible as it is, but my mouse is going off the screen. Okay, let's take out this initial grain of sand. Let's review. I want to add grains of sand, but only if my mouse is within the canvas. Then I want the grains of sand to move down or to the left or right if down is filled, but not if it's on the bottom edge or the left or right edge, it can't leave the canvas. Let's improve a few things about this. One is we can make it more efficient because I don't need to draw all of the black squares. 
Now this is much faster because I'm only drawing the white squares. I'm skipping drawing and just filling the background with black. Let's give ourselves a bit more space. And instead of dropping just a single grain of sand, what if I drop a small collection of sand particles around the area where the mouse is? So I have the column in row, and we could make a little matrix. How about five by five? So I could write another little loop where I want to go from negative two to two. That would be five by five. So I have to say the extent, I don't know if that's a good word to use, would be divide the matrix by two. So I'm going to go from i is negative extent, i is less than or equal to positive extent, i plus plus, j, j, j. And I'm going to call this the mouse column and the mouse row. Because the actual column now is the mouse column plus i, and the actual row is the mouse row plus j. And then here, I can take this and put this in here. So as long as this five by five area, any one of those cells is within the canvas, I should be dropping sand. And you can see I'm dropping a much larger amount of sand now. Nice little stripes, striping effect. Now here's the thing, I don't actually want to do five by five. First of all, that was much bigger than I thought. So let's make this like three, for example. But also, maybe they shouldn't always all be dropping. So what if I were to actually introduce some randomness here? Only if random one, like maybe there's a 75% chance that I'm gonna drop that little grain of sand there. Let's go back to five. So it's a little more amorphous. Okay, now we're dropping some sand. This is just lovely. How about adding some color? So one thing that I've done here is that everything is based off of the state being a zero or a one. But what if I think of the state as being zero or anything that's not zero? As long as the, it's greater than zero, draw the, what if I use its color? Oh, I have an idea. What if I have a hue value equal to zero? And let's say, this is a little bit nuts, color mode, because I have to make everything a rainbow, clearly. HSB, 360 is the default, 255, 255. So this is huge saturation brightness. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to set the grid to a hue value, then I'm going to fill it with that hue value and a full brightness and saturation. As long as the state is greater than zero. Everything else should be the same. Equals, not one, but the current state. So I'm passing the color around. Let's see what happens. You don't see anything. Oh, the hue value is zero. I forgot I can't use a hue value of zero. Oh my goodness. Let's give it a hue value of 200. There, okay, it's blue. The reason why I was doing this is I was thinking, what if the hue changed over time? So hue value plus equals 0 0.1, like as I'm dragging the mouse. Okay, I guess I should have it change a little faster. Ooh, I love this. Okay, well, it's gonna stop at 360. So if hue value is greater than 360, set it back equal to one. Coding challenge complete. However, I don't know if I can release this code without fixing it up just a little bit. Let's write a function to help with this logic down here, a function that returns true or false if a column is within the bounds or not. What should I call this? Within columns, i. Return i is greater than or equal to zero, and i is less than or equal to the columns minus one. So now I can check here, within calls the column, and let's do one for rows. So that cleans up this code just a little bit. 
I can also now clean this code, the state of the current cell. Ah, look at this. I have that variable state, so I can use that here. This will make things a little bit nicer also. I'm checking a random direction, that's fine. I don't love just making them undefined. Let's start with them as negative one. Then if it's within, then I'll give it the actual value. And then these won't trigger unless there's zero, which is not negative one. I don't know if that's better, a little bit better. Maybe I'll put some comments in the code. That'll help a little bit. Just, just hold, hold that thought for a second. I don't need this anymore. Do I dare try this now with the sand smaller? It's divided by half. So this is lovely, but it's missing a kind of critical thing. Notice how the sand is falling at a constant speed. It just so happens I've written this entire book called Nature of Code, all about physics simulation, and chapter two is all about velocity and acceleration. And what is a force but a vector that causes an object with mass to accelerate? Is there a way that I could apply a gravitational acceleration to these little bits of sand as they fall. That would be a little tricky because the sand should be falling more than just one cell at a time. This is a challenge I'm going to leave to you. I'll address it maybe at a live stream and showcase any of you who submit your falling sand simulations to the passenger showcase. I also want to remind you to read Jason Today, well, that's not their last name, but that's their URL, Jason.Today's blog post all about making a falling sand simulator. And you can see here that there is a grid class. Ooh, with a higher order function like fill. Ooh, and this swapping function that allows you to swap two particles. Oh, and they're just using a one dimensional array. You might like this strategy. Oh, and you can see there's like different colors. So uh, there's some other things you could learn by following this post, but hopefully you enjoyed this coding challenge. This was technically another cellular automata, though in truth it's a stochastic one because of the way that I'm randomly moving the sand left or right as it's falling. And I can't wait to see what you make. Have a great day. <laughs>